There's a lily It's in the valley Find it to be right Morning Don't you know that Lily is in the valley Yes, and it's bright As the morning Don't you know there's a Lily Yes, it's in the valley Well, and it's bright As the morning I want to say Amen Well to the bridge, <laughs> took us under the bridge and made us drink. We are so grateful for the experience of the uh, time of praising God, giving him an opportunity to hear our voices and give him our thank you for the blessings that we have enjoyed, not just today, not just this moment, for every day of our lives. Amen. You've often heard it said, we've said ourselves, God is good to us. Amen. And he certainly is better to us than we are to ourselves. Amen. We're grateful for those of you that are here. We're glad that you've come. It's time to uh, now get to the portion of our worship where we study the word of God together and we gain some things that will help us live our lives for the Lord. We're just grateful for all of you that are here again. Grateful for our brothers who have led us in our worship <laughs> Thus far, we appreciate each and every one of you. Good to see Brother Oscar Cole back. He had uh, danced over to the land of the West Coast, uh, and we're grateful that the Lord brought him back uh, safely. We're certainly grateful for that. Uh, I want to just say I, I, I feel so blessed. I got a chance to celebrate uh, my mother's 84th birthday. Amen. Amen. Yeah. That was a time indeed. Uh, that, we, we had a wonderful time. Uh, and, and I'm telling you, it was just great to be able to do that. I, I try to do that as often as I can. And we were blessed. My Two of my children were there. Uh, Eric's on the West Coast. He couldn't make it. But Marvin and Cynthia and Rhonda were there. I should say three of my children yes, were, there. Uh, were there. And we had a great time. And I got a chance to hang around with all my folks. Uh, I try to remind you all every now and again, I, I don't have any people here. My people all up north. 
So when I get a chance to go home, I, I have a wonderful time. We're just grateful to God for that, grateful for the safe trip back, and just so grateful to have this opportunity to worship this morning. Let me get you into your Bibles now. Two places we want to look at. One of them is Second Chronicles chapter number 15, and the other is Hebrews chapter number 12. And let's look at those in reverse order. Let's begin in Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to pull out a few verses there as a stage setting, if you will, for where I really want to go. And that is in the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles. Hebrews chapter number 12. Let me just point out a few of these verses to emphasize where I'm going with this message. Beginning at verse number three, the Bible says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes about faith challenges. I want to use this text because I like how encouraging it can be and how challenging it can be by way of what it says to us. In our experience of God. The Bible in this text talks about the discipline of God. But I'm going to use as a subject. I've had it with God. I've had it with God. From the Old Testament book of. Second Chronicles. We read about a great king. Who if we could. Somehow capture a set of words to express his mindset at the end of his life, it would be, I've had it with God. The king I have reference to is the king Asa. He was the king of the nation of Judah. He was a reformist king, a man that came to the throne at a time when the nation had gone wayward. He sought to try to turn the nation back to the God of heaven. Asa was a man who wanted to reverse the wickedness of his predecessors. The nation had been derailed by paganism and the lifestyle that paganism brings about. It's amazing that what you think about God determines how you live your life. One of the things that God was so often saying to the nation of Israel was uh, that he is not like the other gods that they had heard about. He didn't want to be compared to the Baals. He didn't want to be compared to the Ashtoreth. He didn't want to be compared to the Canaanite gods and and all the other gods, the gods of Moab and the gods of the Canaanites. He said, you shall have no other god before me. And the reason he had that in his mind and revealed that to the people of of the nation of Israel is so that they wouldn't reduce God. To something created. And thereby they wouldn't reduce his morals. To something that's man made. Uh, He wanted to be distinct. And recognized as distinct. And to this end. Asa having read more of the book of law. uh, Decided to leave the ways that he had inherited. Where the people had built shrines for Baal. And the other false gods. He got rid of those things. In the town of Judah. As a result of that, God gave him some peaceful years in his reign. When we read the scriptures, we find that Asa enjoyed uh, 10 years of nice, peaceful reign. Asa used this time to fortify the nation both economically and militarily. But later on in Asa's career, he was attacked. He was attacked by the nation of Cush. The Cushites attacked the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, and the Cushites were a more formidable army than what Judah had. 
Asa ran right to God. Yes, sir. And he asked God for help, for deliverance, for victory over these enemies. Mm -hmm. And God heard Asa, and God calls, as he often does, mm -hmm. a small army to defeat a vastly superior army. All right, all right. As a result of that, Asa continued on in living for the Lord, having experienced such great victory by the hand of God, and having already had uh, gained some knowledge of God, uh, the Lord sent a message to Asa. Uh -huh. It was a message of grace. Right. It was a message of promise. It was a message of challenge. I want you to share that message with me just for a moment here in first or rather second Chronicles chapter number 15 and the first few verses. I want you to hear this message that God sent. The Bible says, now the spirit of God came upon uh, uh, Azariah, the, the, the son of Odin, and he went out to meet Asa and he said to him, watch this carefully, hear me Asa. And all Judah and Benjamin, uh -huh. the Lord is with you while you are with him. Uh -huh. If you seek him, he will be found by you. Uh -huh. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Uh -huh. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God, without a teacher, teaching priest, and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel right. and sought him, he was found by them. Right. In those times there was no peace to the one who went out nor to the one who came in. But great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation and city by city. For God troubled them with every adversity. Right. But you, be strong. And do not let your hands be weak, well. for your work shall be rewarded. Uh -huh. You see, church, this was a message of grace. Right. Yes. Because God chose this man, man. to give him favor. All right. This was a, 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 not only a message of grace, but it was a message of promise. Uh -huh. God said, as long as you're with me, I will be with you. All right, now. All right. But then again, this was a message of challenge. Because again, God said, as long as you're with me, right. I will be with you. And it is from this message that I want to draw out some thoughts for us. I want you to notice that the Bible reveals that God has a unique view of the human condition. Yes, sir. Did you not know that God knows what's happening in Huntsville? Amen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. God knows what's happening in Atlanta. God knows what's happening in the southeast states. He, he knows what's happening uh, across these United States. God knows what's happening in this world. And God has a unique view of the human condition. Now, what do I mean by the human condition? I'm talking about how we get along in this world. God has a unique view of how we get along in our households. He's got a unique view of how we get along in our communities, how we get along in our society, how we get along in the church, how we get along in the country, how we get along in the world. And with God's unique view, we need to take a step back and really see what God said to Asa. First of all, when we look at God's unique view of the human condition, we see that God is always searching for willing followers. Amen. Notice, if you will, verse number two. Once again, hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. God is always looking for willing followers. Amen. Amen. I stress that word willing because God made us after his own image. And to be made after the image of God and then the likeness of God means that God made us with free will. Amen. He made us with the ability to choose how we want to live in his world. God made us that way because God wants people, his human creation, to willingly come to him. God doesn't want coercion. God doesn't want to force us into anything. God wants a relationship with us. And can I remind you that no 
human relationship is worth being in if it is a relationship of coercion. It has to be a relationship of willing, willingness. When a man uh, marries a woman, uh, he wants her to love him, but not by coercion. If he's got any sense about him, he won't try to force her love. He'll try to earn it, if you will. He'll try to win it, if you will, by being the one who expresses love first. Don't you realize that when it comes to our relationship with God, the Bible teaches this is the way God wants it. We love him because he first loved us. God doesn't want humanity following him for fear of what would happen if we don't. Perfect love cast out all fear. He wants people that will willingly follow after him. And when we look at God's view of the human condition, we see that God wants to favor every human being. There are people in this world who think that God doesn't care but about certain people in the world. God is love. And the Bible lets us know the nature of his love. And the Bible lets us know the extent of his love. In a verse that all of us could quote by heart. God so loved the world. That he gave the very best that he had. So God wants a a human being to willingly come to him. But I want you to notice something else about how God looks at the human condition. God will provide divine favor to those who seek him. But he cannot continue divine favor to those who reject him. Notice what he said to Asa, the Lord is with you as long as you be with him. But if you stop with God, he'll stop with you. Somebody says, how can a loving God stop showing his favor when man rejects him? Because God has to stop showing favor when we continue to reject him. If he didn't do that, it would violate his justice. The justice of God cannot allow sin to go on with impunity. The justice of God cannot do like this. I'm going to keep on blessing you no matter how you treat me. I'm going to keep on giving you favor no matter how you treat me. You see, God can't do that. Because if he did that, guess who he has to accept? The same one that tries to cut your throat every day. The same one that tries to destroy your family every day. The same one that tries to destroy your life every day. You see, if God continue to grant favor for people who will not accept him, then he has to accept the Satan too. Right, Satan will be in heaven right with you. You will be on your cloud singing. Uh, talking about there's a lily in the valley and Satan would be right there and saying so is Uh (laughs) so God cannot continue favor (laughs) to those who will not who continue to refuse to follow him and so God said to Asa the Lord is with you Uh as long as you be with him then there's something else we pick out of this text about the human condition, God's view of the human condition, and it is that man's chaotic, destructive condition is a direct result of having no relationship with God. Because they have little to no uh, experiential knowledge of God. I want you to notice it here in verse number 2. Notice how the writer says, if you, if, if you choose God in so many words, he will be with you. But if you forsake him, he'll forsake you. But then watch verse 3 very carefully because God starts explaining what's happening in our world. It's amazing how God does this. He says, for a long time. Israel has been without the true God. I can say that of America. Come on, boy. Right, right, right. I can say that of America. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I can say that of this entire world. Yes, sir. But let me localize it. I can say that of Huntsville. Yes. For a long time, Israel has been without knowledge of or without the true God. Watch this. Without a teaching priest and without law. All 
Do you see how that works? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When there is no relationship with God, right. it is because there is no experiential knowledge of God. All right. All right. What do I mean by experiential knowledge? Anybody can read a book. Come on now. Anybody can read a book. Come on now. But we're not talking about just reading a book. We're talking about experiencing what you read. Years ago, and I may have told this story, and if I did, that's act like you hadn't heard it. Years ago, when I first went to school, I had learned uh, uh, industrial arts, and I took a class in power mechanics. My uncle uh, was, a, was a man who, as a child, used to take apart engines and put them back together again. By the time I was in school studying this stuff, getting into engineering, he was already uh, owning a shop and repairing every kind of car that they brought in there. I came home one semester's in, and I went down to the shop and told him how I'd learned about mechanics, and I told him what I learned and how good I was, and I got A's on all the exams. He said, all right, that's nice. But come on down here and I'll show you how to really do it. All right, all right, all right. You know that made a whole lot of sense? It's one thing to read about it. I can read about a carburetor. Yes, sir. I can read about how to uh, uh, fine tune an engine. Yes. I can read about what kind of spark plugs to give. And yeah. I can read about putting on a timing belt. But all the reading in the world won't help you if you don't actually do it. Come on now. Come on now. You can talk a good game. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But you can't really do it unless you do it. When we talk about chaotic nature and the destructive nature of our communities, of our homes, of our world, of our society. Why is it destructive? When you don't have an experiential knowledge of God, you don't know God. Amen. You really don't know him. You talk about him, but you don't know him. I don't know him. You see, God said to this prophet, to Asa, as he was challenging Asa for a long time, Israel's been without the true God, without a teaching priest, and without law. When you don't have a knowledge of God by experience. Amen. The result is destruction. Well, where is that in the Bible? I want to show it to you. Keep on reading. The Bible lets us know in verse number five, in those times there was no peace and no one who went out, no one who came in, but great turmoil was on the inhabitants of all the lands. Nation destroyed by nation, city by city. For God troubled them with every adversary. What's the point? When you don't have an experiential knowledge of God, you don't know how to live. Right? Yeah, that's, right. that's why we have our world so messed up. That's why we got a candidate talking about building a wall to keep people out. Maybe we ought to let the loose the wall so some of the folk can leave. Well, well. <laughs> I'm talking about the folk that are native here. Yeah. What I'm getting at is the fact that a wall doesn't stop the chaos. Because the chaos is not by border. The chaos is not by state line. The chaos is on the inside. When there's chaos on the inside, it will manifest itself on the outside. And so when the people didn't know God, they act chaotically. What do we have? Every time we see the news here in this city, somebody's in chaos. Read about parents messing around with crystal meth. Infecting their very babies. Causing a life of misery for a child who never asked for it. Read about men taking up weapons against their own spouses. Taking their lives. We read about women taking up weapons against their husbands, taking their lives. We read about people abusing women, people abusing men. We read about all types of chaotic activity. And then whenever we try to curtail it by means of law, we even find that's a problem because folk who are messed up on the inside don't know how to treat one another on the outside. The one that Jesus said, it's not what you eat that messes you up. That stuff doesn't mess you up. Go on, have your pig feet. If you're so inclined. Have your fat back sandwich. If you're so inclined. 
Go on and just eat vegetables if you're so inclined. What I'm getting at is that basically what we eat does not determine who we are on the inside. It might impact how your heart beats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How your kidneys function, uh-huh. how your lungs function, uh-huh. but I'm not talking about physical things. Uh-huh. I'm talking about the inner man. Yeah. What we eat does not uh, poison the inner man. Right. The inner man is already poisoned by sin. Right. Come on. Right. So Dr. Jesus doesn't start with your diet right. in terms of your physical food. Right. Yes, sir. He starts on the inside yeah. right. about your spiritual nature, right. Right. about my spiritual nature. Right. This is why he told Nicodemus, I don't care that you are Jew by birth. You must be born again. Amen. Amen. You need a change from the inside out. Right. So when the Bible talks to us this morning from this text, we find out that chaos was in the nation because the people didn't have an experiential knowledge of God. Right. And I want to share something else while I'm driving down this avenue. I hope that we can pull out of this text the importance of a preacher. Yeah. I'll put a cord in the meter here. I'm probably going somewhere where you don't expect, but I want you to see it here. You see, it's instructed to see the importance of the role of a preacher, not just to the church, but to the community, to the society, to the country, to the world. You see, folks, suddenly Satan has deceived too many preachers, churches, and Christians to be so focused on entertainment, so focused on sophistry and church tradition that the teaching of the gospel and the implications of it get thrown out of the window. Big business to preach Jesus these days. It's big business. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. You can get a TV show Come on, yes, sir. preaching Jesus. Yeah. And if you add some drama to it, you really got yourself something going right, on. Right. If you throw in all the inner workings of what's happening behind the scenes outside of Sunday morning, what's happening in the back rooms and in the choirs and all these other places, you get a hit TV show. Yeah. And we miss what it's all about. Preaching has never been about having your name in lights. That's right, that's right. It's always been about trying to get people to have an experiential knowledge of God. Amen. No wonder this Bible teaches us right here in the same verse in verse number three. For a long time, Israel has been without the true God. Why were they without the true God? Without a teaching priest. Oh, I know the priests weren't teaching. Amen. Come on now. What teaching, how can you expect to have an experience of God? All right, sir. There must be a teaching of the word so that people can learn, not just intellectually, but so that people can know experientially what it is like to live for the Lord. And this is what we're about here at Westview. We're not here trying to have a show. Amen. Come on, now. It's not about a show. Amen. It's about learning the word. Amen. Brown, why does why does Highsmith always try to teach so thoroughly God's word? Why does Dickerson and why do why does Stone and why do you why do you try to teach so thoroughly the word of God? Because this is what it's all about. Amen. We get to learn the Lord, Amen. and we learn to live with Him, Amen. and we learn to live for Him. And not only will we impact what happens in here, which is just a part of it, we'll impact what happens out there. Amen. We'll impact what happens when you get home today. Yes, Pull in your driveway. Come on now. Open up your door. Right. Take off your church clothes. And start dealing with your children and dealing with your spouses and dealing with whomever else may live in your household. You see, if what is going on in here is not what's going on in here, it will never go on in your home. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, what's not, and, and if this is not going, in, going on in your home, then it'll never reciprocate into what's going on here. This is serious business. Israel was in chaos because of no experiential knowledge of God. National crisis served as a time of judgment and a call to repentance. I want you to look at these same verses. Y'all thought I left the text. I'm still here. Look at verse number four. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel. Do you not know? Come on now. That this nation has historically turned to God whenever God turned the nation out. Okay. 
In World War One, God turned the world upside down. And folk decided to run to God. In World War Two, God turned the world upside down. Hitler didn't just pop up out of anywhere. All right. Just like Assyria didn't just come out of nowhere. Hitler didn't come out of nowhere. God raised up an enemy to shake the world. Why did he shake the world? Because when man stops looking toward God, God has to do something. To shake up the world. And I'm telling you, I'm not a prophet. I'm not, uh, I'm not a clairvoyant individual. But I know how to watch things. Come on, man. You know how to watch things. And I believe God's about to shake up this country. Again. I believe he's about to shake it up again. When we start passing laws that have men living with men as if they're living with women. And women living with women as if they're living with men. God's about to shake up the nation. We have laws that are passed that keep the poor people poor. And take even more from them. God's about to shake up the nation. We have one percent living off of eighty percent of the nation's wealth. God's about to shake up this nation. God shakes up this nation. He does it to give us a chance to turn our hearts to Him. He did the same thing back then. Look at the Bible once again, verse number four. When they got in trouble, they turned to God and sought Him and found Him. Look at verse number five. In those times, there was no peace, and I'm telling you, there won't be any peace till man starts looking to God. That's right. We ought to start hiring more minorities as police officers. That's not the only thing you need to do. Come on now. Come on now. That might be a part of the problem too. Come on now. Say that now. The problem is not what's on the outside. The problem is what's on the inside. It's the inside. That's the problem. Yes, sir. That's right. God said this is, he said and during that time in verse number six, nation uh, was destroyed by nation. All right. What are we doing now? We we trying to we trying to get ourselves in military alignment. Worried about what Putin's going to do. Is he building a stronger arsenal? We're worried about some of the smaller nations. Did they did they get it? Did Kim Jong il is is he really about to attack South Korea? You see, we're worried about all this stuff. Why are we worried? Because in the past, nation has destroyed nation. Since this world has been in in spinning, nation has destroyed nation. Why does God allow it? Because God wants us to wake up. And see that he is God. Notice the end of verse 6. Before I move on. City destroying city. For God troubled them. With every adversity. Well this was the challenge to Asa. Having received this challenge. Asa decided. He would really dedicate himself to the Lord. I want you to notice now as we continue in the Bible. You all still with me here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I've been home. Let me change it back to the south. Y'all still with me? Look at verse number eight. Having heard these words, all right. Asa decided that he would get moving. All right. He took. Uh, counsel he took uh, uh, courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin Uh from the cities which he had taken in the mountains of Ephraim and he restored the altar of the Lord and as that was before in, in the vestibule of the Lord he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and to those who dwelt with them from Ephraim Manasseh Simeon and they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that his, his, the Lord his God was with him you see Asa heard this challenge and he said you know what I'm going to I'm going to take a chance on God I'm going to make a covenant with God all right, all right. He's already given me victory in my first battle. I'm going to trust him. And he decided I'm going to turn this whole nation back to God. And this is the reform that he led. He committed himself in the nation to a covenant with the Lord. I want you to understand something. Uh, When it comes to really turning our lives to God, it can't just be going through the motions. 
Amen. It has to be a heart of commitment. Amen. It has to be a heart of commitment. All serious seekers of God must be willing to cut loose anybody and anything that stops them from keeping to that commitment. I want you to notice that I'm pulling it out of verse number 13. Notice this. The Bible says, and whoever would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, was to be put to death. Mm. Whether small or great, whether man or woman. Brown, are you saying we ought to put people to death today? I think you understand the point. Mm -hmm. The point is, when anyone stops you from really committing your life to the Lord, you need to cut that person off. You need to cut that person out of your life. That person has no good value for you. In terms of your relationship with God, if he or she doesn't want to follow after what you're following, you need to cut him or her loose. Not only that, but I want you to see something else in this text. Drop down to verse number 16. Also, he removed Micah, the mother of Asa the king, from being queen mother because she had made an obscene image of Asherah. And Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed and burned it by the brook Kidron. Don't even let your family stop you from standing for God. Oh, this is good stuff here. This is good stuff here. Some men can't be standing for God because they won't be willing to fight against their wives who don't want to stand for God. All right, all right. Some women can't stand for God because they are too mealy mouth among a, a, a husband that doesn't want to stand for God. Uh-huh. What I'm sharing with you is that nobody can stop us. Maybe nobody should stop us all right. from standing for the Lord. And this is what Asa did. He did all of this and as a result of that God gave him peace and prosperity for 20 long years. Wouldn't you like 20 years of peace and prosperity? Wouldn't you like 20 years in your life where there's nothing to disturb your rest? Some of us would like 20 minutes of that. God gave him 20 years of it because he committed himself to the Lord. So Asa enjoyed a relationship of God's favor for 20 long years. But there's another end, a part of the story we need to get to. Remember, the subject is, I'm tired of God. I'm tired of God. I've had it with God. This same man that I've been telling you about, Soon reached the point where he said, I had it. All right. I've had it with God. No God follower can forget that in order to follow God, it is not a temporary convenience. It's a lifelong journey. Somewhere I read, be thou faithful unto death. I will give you a crown of life. There's a need for lifelong faithfulness. I want you to know that when we decide to yield and follow God like Asa did, God will give us peace and prosperity. I'm not talking about riches by way of money. There's a prosperity that money can't buy. I'd rather come home to a, to a wife who's not having a pot to throw at my head. All right, Jack. Well, well. All right. Than to come home with pockets full of money. Uh-huh. Are y'all following what I'm yes, saying? Sir. Yes, sir. I'd rather come home to children that are peaceful yeah. than coming home only to know I have to run down to the city jail yeah, yeah, yeah. and right. get them out. All right, right. I want prosperity yeah. that money can't buy. All right. God gave him 20 years of it. And yet in that 20 year span, there was something that you and I uh, need to learn about Asa and something we need to learn about ourselves. And that is when you follow God, you have to expect that there will be a faith challenge. Amen. Right. There will be a faith challenge. No follower of God can avoid a faith challenge. They can come in a variety of ways. Can I tell you the only predictable thing about a faith challenge? The only predictable thing is the unpredictability of what it will be and when it will be. All right, all right. You never know how God is going to challenge your faith. You never know when 
God is going to challenge your faith. Don't go home and pull out an Excel, Excel spreadsheet and try to calculate. Come on now. Come well, on. I've been blessed for five weeks. Yeah. So week six, God's going to get me. Right. That's not how it works. All right, now. As that old commercial goes, that's not how any of this works. Faith challenges are sure to come, and experiencing them is the only means of determining the quality and genuineness of our faith. You and I will never know how real we are until we face a faith challenge. We will never know what we're made of until we face a faith challenge. We'll never know the quality of our faith until we face faith challenges. And Asa was going to be hit with the faith challenge. But the problem is when Asa hit a faith challenge, Asa said, I've had it with God. I've had enough of God. The crucial element of every faith challenge is whether we will depend on man or God. It doesn't matter what happens in the challenge by way of what it looks like. What God is trying to get to is will you believe in me or will you believe in something else? Let's look at Asa. Asa's faith challenge came after 20 years of peace and prosperity. He had been blessed so richly. You can read this in the 16th chapter. When Asa faced his challenge, his challenge was the rise of another nation coming to take over his nation. It was a nation that was fierce, and they came to attack Asa. Now remember, the first time this happened in Asa's career, he ran right to God. And he said, Lord God, we are being attacked for no reason outside of this nation attacking us. Lord, we don't have the army of the attacking nation. Please help us. And God said, no problem. Asa was thinking it's a huge army. Uh, God said, who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? And so God gave him victory this time. 20 years later, he's attacked. And the first thing he does is run to a third nation. And he asks them if they would help him and stop him from being attacked. I don't know if you're getting this or not. The first time, Lord, help me, God says, I'm right here. I told you I'll be with you as long as you are with me. The second time, after 20 years, the first thing he does is run to another nation and says, I need you all to help me because these guys are jumping on me. Will you help me by jumping on them? Well, why would not he call on the Lord as he had done the first time? Well, I thought about that. Perhaps like us. Years of peace and prosperity had caused him to put more trust in God's means of blessing rather than God as the source of blessing. Did did you hear that? Yes, sir. Did you not know that God blesses you by means of various things? Mm -hmm. He blesses me by means of various things. But did you also not know that it's easy to get so dependent on the means Mm. that we forget the source? Come on now. Come on now. I watched Channel 19 News this morning. They were doing a report about the election and which candidate was going to pump money into NASA. Mm -hmm. My ears perked up. Because when they say government money to NASA, I say, come on, retirement. My job is all all right. However, they were saying that NASA's funding has stayed constant the last few times. No increase. In the Kennedy years, you remember, there was the space race, and there was great funding coming from the government to NASA. Here we are in 2016, you hardly hear anything about it. I had to think again. I said, you know, there's no need to worry about the 
means of my income. Come on now. The means is the job at NASA. Right. Are y'all following me here? Yes, sir. But I don't want to get so caught up on the means. Come on now. That I forget the source. Right. There you go. The source provides the means. Yeah, that's right. Some of you are on fixed income. Mm-hmm. You get Social Security check. Uh-huh. Are y'all here today? Yes, sir. I must be in a tough area here. It's getting quiet. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes the government starts talking about tapping into Social Security. Right. And folk get antsy. Yeah. Say, wait a minute. That's my next day you're messing up. Uh-huh. But sometimes we can get so caught up in the means, yeah. the Social Security check, right. yeah. that we forget the source. Right. The one who gave Roosevelt enough sense yes, to put that it in right. place right. in the first place. Right. You won't hear me today. That's it, we got different jobs, don't we? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Some of you work one place, some of you work another place. Uh-huh. And we like the means of the blessing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We depend on that means. Don't we? Right. Some of us already budgeted out how we, what money we're getting for the rest of the month. Uh-huh. And when we, we get on in, online and we do these exercises called like every dollar. We want to account for every dollar we get. That's good budgeting. And we're thinking about the means. And, and then we look and we say, wait a minute now. Uh, there's an unexpected bill. I didn't expect to come out and turn the key and the car just say click. Yeah. Right now. Come on. <laughs> now I have to take it down the shop. And they told me it's going to cost me $600 uh-huh. to get this alternator and yeah. uh, to get this yeah. done and, and that done. And by the way, right. the tires are balding and I need some struts and the shocks are gone. And I need all these other exhaust problems fixed and I don't have the money. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. I've been playing for it on every dollar. All right. All right. All right. Now it's costing me every dollar. We start looking at the money coming in and we say, wait a minute. It's not, it's not evening out. And then we start thinking, wait, now they're talking about laying off. And we get all worried about the means of the blessing. Don't forget the source who provided the means. Because if the source provided you the means you currently have, he's got much more in his storehouse. Maybe Asa decided to call on another nation because he got so caught up in the means he forgot the source. Perhaps like us, he became lax in his development of an experiential knowledge of the Lord. It's easy to become lax when it comes to that. Do you know the life of a Christian must include what we... We had a study here one time. It must include spiritual disciplines. Yes. Yes, sir. It includes reading. All right, now. The Word. Right. Mm-hmm. I don't want you to answer. How much time do you spend in the Word during the week? All right, then. Mm-hmm. Think about it. Ask yourself that. It includes meditation, not just reading, but thinking about it. You can be reading, uh, be angry and sin not. Uh-huh. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. What happens tomorrow morning? Before you get the first cup of coffee, Come on now. and somebody's already up in your grill. Well, well. I think I can say that right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Somebody up in your grill, right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Bad breath in the morning in your grill. <laughs> and dealing with you despitefully. Yeah. Well. How much are you thinking, or am I thinking about that text? Be angry, but don't sin. Yeah. And let me modernize it. I'm going to interpret it. You know, you can get mad at the indignity, but don't cuss them out. That's the Michael Brown translation. That's plain, yeah, I think you understand it, right? Yes, sir. Uh, see, we need meditation. We need prayer. Lord, help me. I can't live like this Amen. on my own. Yes, sir. need fellowship. Amen. Time spent together. Right. See, fellowship, you don't have to have a biscuit to have fellowship. Most of the time we have fellowship, we're thinking of biscuit and chicken. We need food to have fellowship. Fellowship can be a phone call. Fellowship can be, you know, let's let's, let's take a 
walk down at the track there. Let's talk about some stuff. That could be fellowship. Iron sharpens iron. As we work together, you see, perhaps Asa had gotten lazy about that. As a result of that, he didn't have the relationship with the Lord he needed to have. Right. Perhaps like us, he limited his thoughts of God to his own limited experience of God. Come on, Come on now. Do you not know none of us have seen fully what God can do for us? All right. None of us have seen fully All right. what God can do for us. Right. Oh, you've seen some things. I've seen some things too. All right. But I haven't seen the whole thing. No, you haven't seen the whole thing. And so we can tend to limit what God can do for us to what we've already had him do for us. Amen. Are you here this morning? Well, Lord, you know, I know last time I lost my job, you, you gave me a different one. Uh-huh. I thank you for it. But, but this time, this time, it doesn't look the same. I don't know if you can do it this time. Abraham, go to a land that I'll show you. Here's Abraham going to the land. Not even worried about it. God said go. And he says, I'm going. Until he got to Egypt. Uh Uh-oh. Somebody's going to look at Sarah. She fine. (laughs) She got the motion in the ocean. (laughs) She looked good. I just went to Victoria's Secrets and got her some stuff for me. Some of y'all missed that. Tell him you're my sister. Wait a minute. You didn't ask God for directions. You, 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 you went on travel. You didn't ask him for a AAA map. You didn't even ask him for a GPS. You just left. You thought he was good enough then. Why now that you hit Egypt do you think he's infis- insufficient? Right. Come on now. Right. Right. Let's not blame Abraham. We do the same thing. Yes, sir. Right. Yes, sir. Lord, you're good for this, but you're not good for that. Right. Lord, you're good for me to make money. You're good for a nice job for me, Lord. But when it comes to trouble with my children, Come on now. I need to go to Dr. Phil and ask him, no. what Please, should I do? All right, sir. Trouble with my spouse. I need to go uh, to Judge Judy. Oh, well, well. Ask her what should I do. You better leave Judy alone. And right. Listen to what God had to say. All right, now. Well, let me move on. Y'all all right? I'm almost done. Look at this. Find that Asa decision. His, his decision was soundly condemned. I've got I to gotta hasten on. You read a little bit later in chapter 16, God came to him and God said, I want to know why you didn't come to me this time. Why didn't you come to me this time? All right, I helped you before. Yeah. And that situation was tougher than this one. Right. Why didn't you come to me? Yes, now you're going to, I, con- I condemn your choice. Yes, you see, what God did was discipline him. Whom the love, Lord loves, he disciplines. God disciplined him. And when God disciplined him, God did so hoping that Asa's heart would be humble enough to say, I messed up. I'm coming out with my hands up, Lord. But no, that's not how Asa reacted. Asa got mad. He got mad at God. Do you hear what I'm saying? He got mad at God. Some of us sit here and we say, oh, I'll never get mad of God. Really? You know, when your life changes to a degree that you didn't expect, it's easier than you think to get mad with God. Asa got mad with God. He got so mad with God, he started treating other people badly. He punished people as king. Right. He was taking out his frustration on all the people, but he was really mad with God. Sometimes we wonder why people can treat us so shabbily. Uh-huh. I'm talking about Christian folk. Yes, sir. Now, why are they treat me so bad? Because sometimes the folk treating you bad, treating me bad, really have a problem with God. Right. It's just that they can see us. Uh-huh. So they vent on us, but their problem is with God. Asa had a problem with God. 
Unfortunately, rather than use divine discipline as an opportunity to repent, he became bitter against God. What can make a Christian bitter against God? Well, one thing is unrealistic, non-biblical expectations. Many Christians have really never known God, not the God of the Bible. A lot of us know the God of Grandma. Well, well. Oh, we know the God of Grandpa, yes, sir. Yeah. but but we don't know the God of the Bible, and we don't know the God of the Bible because we never went beyond what somebody told us. You can't just be told about God. You got to know him for yourself. If you have a child, get your child to learn about God on his or her own gradually. Are, 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 are you understanding? Yes, sir. Gradually. Teach them a little bit more about God and, 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 and get them to, because sooner or later they're going to have to make their own choice. Right, man. Don't let them just know God by what you say. That's right. Let them learn God for themselves over time. Some believe things about God from hearsay that God never said about himself. All right. Come on now. Have you heard this? Yeah, God said, if you take one step, he'll take two. Yeah. Well, well. How many of you heard that? You heard yes, that. Sir. Yes, sir. God never said that one time. All right. <laughs> he never said that. All right, God. He never said it. Other folks, well, God knows what's in my heart. Well, first of all, you put your hand in the wrong place. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Secondly, uh, you're saying more than you think. All right. Because God really does know. The heart. Yes, sir. He knows the platitude that comes out of our mouths, and he knows the real sense of what's going on in our heads. See, we got to know God for ourselves. Sometimes we have the wrong view of God. Sometimes it's unrealistic expectations that make us bitter against God. Sometimes we get bitter against God because we become spiritually spoiled. Let me give you another, some free advice for your children again. Brown, what are you talking about? You don't know anything about children. I, I know a little bit. Okay. All right now, all right now. A little bit about race. Yes, sir, yes, sir. I know one thing. You can't give them everything they want. Good, sir. Amen. I know that much. Christmas time coming up. Come on now. Yes, sir. Daddy! What? I want you to buy me a brand new Camaro. Look out now. You're 11 years old. <laughs> Come on. You know, some parents are silly enough, silly enough to buy any and everything the child wants. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's tantamount to just taking your checkbook and, and, and giving it to your job. Hmm. Go cash your check when you get paid and give all the money to your job. Well, that's, that's tantamount to doing that. All right, man. There's a reason we're called parents. That's right, man. Because children don't know what we know. Right, some of us get spiritually spoiled. God's been so good. Yeah. He's been a little bit too good in human, in human way of thinking. Right. Lord, I want to use you as a divine vending machine. Mm. Put a prayer in. Cha-ching! Get whatever I want. That's not the God of the Bible. Amen. Amen. Sometimes we have a sense of divinely owned debt. Well, In other words, God, you owe me. Mm. Asa spent the rest of his life in bitterness with God. Well, let me come to a conclusion. You see, Asa was basically saying, I've had it with God. He got sick late on in his life. Right. Somewhere I read, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Uh-huh. For the time draw near and the evil, uh, 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 draw nigh when you shall say, I, I have no pleasure in them. All right. What that text is talking about is, uh, while you're young and you got your good health and strength, All right. give God praise. Mm-hmm. Give him praise. Yes, right. Because the day is coming. Hey. Well, you won't be able to do this. Right? You think you're all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> so far. <laughs> Day is coming when you can't, you know, right. do this. Right. You do it all. Yeah. Day is coming. Yeah. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Day is coming when you have to look, look real. I'm almost there now. What is, what is that? The day comes. I didn't 
didn't always need this. I could look, see across the street, read the sign. Now I take these off and you all think I'm looking at you. <laughs> you think that. But I can no more see your face clearly than, than, than I can see the man on the moon right now. I see blur. All right, all right. And so when you look at my license, it said, he must wear glasses. All right now, all right now. So you see, the Bible lets us know the body, the body changes. Yes, it does. It's good to praise God while you can right now. I have four eyes. I praise God. I got four. Well, actually, I think I have six because I have bifocal. So you I praise him. And I can still see. I remember what I can see better. But I praise him. I can still see right now. You see, we have to recognize God and Asa. He got a foot disease. And when his foot got, his feet got so bad, uh, he didn't even call God. He called the, he don't, he called the doctors. Yes, he did. He sure did. But he didn't call God. Right. Isn't that something? Mm -hmm. What did he say in his heart? I think he said, I've had it with God. I've had it with God. Let me conclude with this. Church, you and I have to deal with our faith, faith challenges. And we have to deal with them in the right way so that we don't ever say in our hearts, I've had it with God. Amen. Amen. How do we deal with them? First of all, know that they will come. If your life is going well right now, enjoy it. Enjoy it. It's not going to last. Can I tell you that again? It's not going to last. It's not going to last. Know that they would come. And then secondly, consistently prepare for them. Faith challenges are coming. Get ready for it. You know how to get ready for them? Exercise. Exercise. Spiritually, exercise. All right, all right. Practice spiritual disciplines. Thirdly, develop, or should I say expand, your faith in the Lord. Expand it. You trust Him for what you do right now. Go out into the water a little deeper. Expand your faith in the Lord. Fourthly, and lastly, Use godly discipline as an opportunity to grow closer to, not farther away right. from the Lord. Southwest, the misery and pain ain't a day without stress. No doubt that's the way the world was never meant for. Asking all the questions, answers plain and simple, the official. What color for this planet is green, so all the colorblind folks coming up.